the U.S.-China rivalry. This would be, of course, the fantasy scenario for the Chinese to see a U.S. aircraft carrier on fire. This was, in fact, an aircraft accident that occurred during the Vietnam War aboard one of the uh, U.S. aircraft carriers. China's foreign policy. Deng Xiaoping advised that China should attain the Taoist virtue of the negative, of avoiding confrontation and avoiding attention in order to enable China to develop economically. Tao Guang Yanghui. China expected that the post-Cold War environment would become multipolar, but instead it reverted to a unipolar system around the United States. China was surprised when Russia failed to intervene against the U.S. in its sphere of influence during the Kosovo War and the U.S. bombing of Serbia in 1999 in the Balkans. The U.S.'s tendency towards unilateralist foreign policy behavior under the presidency of George W. Bush led China to adopt a multilateralist foreign policy in the world. China's military was intended as a form of a risk fleet and army to deter any state by virtue that it would weaken the attacker against its third parties. As China became the second largest spender on defense, China could not but avoid the focus of the U.S. Instability in the Balkans and the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks on the U.S. led to U.S. interventions in the Middle East and South Asia and delayed what was already a gradual realignment of the U.S. from Europe towards Asia, provoked in part by the need to develop a missile defense that could stop a North Korean attack. Chinese President Hu Jintao's theory from 2002 to 2012 of Sanhe, the three R harmonies, was peace in the world, reconciliation with Taiwan, and harmony in Chinese society. There were other slogans, such as in 2003, China's peaceful rise, in 2004, China's peaceful development. Then occurred the 2008 financial crisis in the U.S., which a great many Chinese observers interpreted as the decline of the U.S., and it was a trigger for a dramatic change in China's foreign policy, abandoning Deng Xiaoping's policy of slow, non-confrontational economic development into greater confrontationalism with the U.S. This was realized when Xi Jinping became China's president in 2012, and he initiated the new slogan of the China Dream. Here you can see what was expected to be the point of power and economic transition between China and the U.S. in 2016. This was uh, foreseen in the early 2000s, and it did not come to pass. U.S.-China trade in 2015 was 598 billion U.S. dollars, and it grew to 690 billion in 2022, so not a huge increase. U.S. investments in China in 2015 were 298 billion, and this dropped to 119 billion in 2022. Now, the widespread view is that the U.S. is in decline because of the diffusion of technology to China. And the reasoning is that China is economically catching up by leapfrogging on the innovation of the Western states. The U.S. military is overstretched and spends too much of its income on social entitlements for its domestic population, coupled with declining investment in technological innovation. So China is leapfrogging up the value chain and soon therefore manufacture and export high technology products. China has the critical advantage of low wages and reasonable levels of productivity. So the policy question is, should the U.S. cut off trade with China or constructively engage China by seeking to trade with it? What best increases U.S. security? Now the policy of containment, the containment strategy, has its origins in the Cold War and was elaborated by George F. Kennan, then a State Department official working in Moscow. He basically articulated how the U.S. would confront and defeat the Soviet Union. He argued that there was no need to go to war to defeat communism. He argued that as Russia developed economically, it would create a middle class that would inevitably become dissatisfied with the political system, and the system would be overthrown from within. All the U.S. had to do was surround the USSR with allies and military bases to deter it from expansion in the interim. An important component of the strategy was economic isolation of the USSR.
However, unlike the USSR, China is not adequately self-sufficient to be able to function in economic isolation and maintain a large armed force. U.S. Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, under the Truman administration in the U.S. in the early Cold War period, articulated the strategy of a peaceful evolution strategy against Russia and China. Chinese leader Bo Yibo quoted Mao's response, quote, Mao said that America wanted to subvert and change us. In other words, it wants to keep its order and change our system. It wants to corrupt us by peaceful evolution. So China very early on was aware of the domestic implications to the Chinese Communist Party from the containment strategy. Here's uh, China's perception of different U.S. military bases located in uh, Asia. Here's a more detailed description of the different U.S. bases. The bases in the Philippines are, of course, uh, significantly exaggerated. The U.S. is occasionally deployed in the Philippines, but doesn't currently have bases, despite negotiations with the Manila government in 2022. A second strategy is rollback. The alternative to containment was rollback, seeking to incrementally weaken and invade segments of the Soviet Empire, such as behind the Iron Curtain and in Afghanistan. British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, in a 1962 speech, stated two military principles. One, do not march on Moscow, and two, do not fight with your land armies in China. So this is basically the observation that China is simply too large to conduct rollback. Uh, and even against North Korea, because it's adjacent ch to China, any attempt would be overstretched against China's local advantages. A third strategy is constructive engagement, establishing extensive trade activity with China to increase Chinese standards of living, create a middle class, and ultimately the overthrow of the communist system. The U.S. is pursuing constructive engagement with China, recognizing China's rise as inevitable and seeking instead to bring China into the democratic fold and subject to the expectations of the democratic peace theory. The idea that in a world of nuclear weapons, war is always possible, but in a world of democracies where democracies do not fight each other, uh, there will not be a nuclear war. So here there are expectations of the limits of Chinese power. So China's got three sources of power. Those are economic, military power, and soft power. In terms of economic power, China's GDP is valued at approximately 18 trillion, which is less than 80% of US 22 trillion. Most of that GDP in China is production, not consumption. The Chinese people could not afford to consume what they make. The oil China buys is with money from its international export markets. What matters for military spending is not national wealth, but surplus wealth, since much of China's economy is agricultural and occupies the 30% of the population that are rural. China, for example, was the world's largest economy, in fact, even during its century of humiliation. Developing states, because of their administrative weakness compared to developed states, can convert a much smaller part of their economies for war. The U.S. could likely increase its 3.6% defense budget to 50% as it did during the Second World War, but China could probably not do much more than increase its 2.3% defense spending to 20%. Per capita income is a much better determinant of a state's ability to extract power from its economy. At the moment, only 7% of U.S. exports go to China. This is less than 1% of the U.S. GDP. Although, of course, there are follow-on effects in terms of consumer benefits from cheap products from China. So the U.S. has a $2 trillion export in 2022 of which only 150 billion is to China. So here you can see the expected crossover in military spending between the US and China in the late 2030s. 90% of China's high-tech exports are actually low-tech components which are 90% foreign-owned.
and Korea grew with 0% foreign direct investment, whereas China is 70% dependent on foreign owned enterprises. If conditions cause these companies to leave, like Toyota, Microsoft, General Motors, or Tesla, before China assimilates innovation, China will stagnate. China has passed a law that 2.5% of its GDP must be set on research and development in 2020. But then the research effort may not be well spent. China has one of the largest government and intelligence bureaucracies dedicated to the intelligence acquisition of technology from Western countries in Japan, but it has difficulty assimilating it. China is in some respects emulating Germany's 19th century industrialization leapfrog, which made Germany one of the most technologically advanced states in the 20th century. But Germany did it with one of the best university systems in the world, which China currently lacks. If China does not structurally adjust its economic and legal system to protect intellectual property rights of its citizens, even if it is stealing from abroad, and permit private financial capital for startups, China will never assimilate the ability to innovate technologically and will stagnate at the middle income trap. Military power is the product essentially of economic power and the availability of high technology coupled with human capital, which is made up of the educational levels of the population coupled with the cultural tradition of the Chinese military. Given China's performance against Japan in the Second World War, the US in Korea, India in 1962, and Vietnam in 1979, China's military culture is adequate, but not exemplary. China's soft power is an important factor in obtaining the voluntary acquiescence by other states of a power's role in global governance. Soft power is composed of the attractiveness of a state's culture, its domestic and international values, and their use in foreign policy to morally legitimate their actions, and be emulated and cooperated with by other states. For example, China takes great pride in being one of the oldest continuous civilizations, with 100 million people studying Mandarin globally, tourism, fast economic growth, foreign students, prevalence of Chinese food, film, and chopsticks. Political culture can matter. It is often said that the Western consumer culture of jeans, coke, and rock and roll caused the collapse of the Soviet Union. China's popular developmental model, called the Beijing Consensus, focuses on innovation, experimentation, gradualism, as opposed to Western World Bank neoliberal pro-market shock treatments. Now, there are shortcomings. China's authoritarian political system is not very attractive, and its soft power in general does not extend well beyond its immediate neighbors. In terms of culture-based industries, it's dominated by the U.S., which is around 42.6% from the European 33.9%, Japan 10%, and China only 6%. One measure of soft power influence is where elites send their children internationally for university schooling. The president and premier of China both Li Keqiang, before he was replaced in January of 2023, and Xi Jinping, both sent their daughters to Harvard University in Boston. Here you can see a picture of Centrally, which says that in 2012, 85% of Ch Chinese families worth uh, US $1 million or more wanted to send their children to the West to study, ideally to the US. 20% uh, to the US, 22% to the UK, 15% to Canada, 7% to Australia, 5% to Singapore, 5% to Switzerland, 4% to Hong Kong, 3% to Germany, 3% to France, 2% to Japan, and 3% elsewhere. Now, another challenger. The US would be a formidable adversary for China, in part because its structure is the outcome of the adaptation to previous challengers. The threat of the Soviet Union led the U.S. to abandon isolationism and adopt a balanced and long-term military economic investment to organize a global alliance against Soviet expansion. The USSR achieved periods of nearly 6% economic growth through the 1950s and 5% in the 1960s, but then slowed in the 1970s, contracted then in the 1980s. The U.S. avoided the collapse of the USSR because it did not overstretch itself like Moscow did with its military investments. Number two, the 1973 Middle East oil crisis and embargo triggered by the 1973 Arab-Israeli war compelled the U.S. to reduce its dependence on Middle Eastern oil and diversify its use of energy. The Middle East never capitalized on their energy power because of their inability to cooperate amongst themselves despite OPEC. Number three, 
Japan's growth rates were 10% in the 1960s and 5% in the 1970s. Japan's economy was projected to pass that of the U.S. sometime in the 1990s. The U.S. adapted by opening up its market to external trade for the purposes of disciplining labor and increasing productivity, which pulled the U.S. economy from 18% of the world's total in 1980 to 25% by 1995. Japan failed to overtake the U.S. because its sclerotic economic, social, and political systems stifled innovation. With regard to China, the U.S.'s critical advantages are, one, its domestic political and legal system, which are chaotic but perceived to be legitimate. Two, its social capital and immigration policies, which attract talent into high technology from all over the world. And three, U.S. soft power that enables it to organize alliances on a regional or a global scale. The U.S.'s social culture is open to immigration which empowers the U.S. During the Second World War, when the U.S. was fighting Germany and Japan, the supreme commanders in both the European Front and the Pacific Campaign were both, both German-Americans, Admirals Nimitz and General Eisenhower, who later became president. This is Heidi Xu, a Chinese-Canadian who was employed by the Raytheon Corporation and later by the Pentagon in procurement. There are a great many Chinese Americans in critical positions in the US government and the military which empowers the US. There are almost no white Americans employed within the Chinese government. The consequences of China not having immigration is a general decline of its labor force and a severe increase in the burden of the labor force in dealing with investments. The Economist reports that China is becoming competitive with the U.S. in research and development by relying on private investment in research. There is the possibility of war during a China-U.S. power transition. The U.S. and China's economies are very close. Normally, the transition point for a power transition is around 80%. When China's economy is getting closer to that of the U.S., and China has the power in order to militarily assert itself. Currently, China's economy is at 72%. A power transition war did not occur between the U.S. and the U.K. in the 1890s because of the democratic peace, even though the U.S. had the largest economy by the 1890s or between the U.S. and the USSR during the Cold War because they both had nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence kept the peace. So some of the conventional explanations for the Cold War not turning into a violent exchange was one, economic interdependence. The Soviet Union didn't trade much with the West, but it couldn't attract allies in the developing world who were trading with the Western democracies. Two, the obsolescence of war, even the Russian population, having memories of the Second World War, believed that war would be fairly undesirable. And number three, the nuclear revolution. The knowledge of the crystal ball effect that war could escalate to a nuclear exchange, and this was a very high threshold for starting a conflict. Now, the problem with peaceful transition argument is as follows. One, economic interdependence. This was, in fact, present in the lead-up to the First World War. Uh, between Germany and the UK in 1913, they were each other's largest trading partners, not to then be achieved again in proportion to their economies until 1970. But vulnerability led Germany to go to war. The implication is that despite US-Chinese interdependence, nationalism may prevail and permit conflict. Number two, despite the First and Second World Wars, China's population may not view war as entirely undesirable, just as the U.S. has found wars to pursue that were popular, like the 1991 Gulf War against Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. Number three, great power competition persisted under the nuclear umbrella, and states still sought nuclear superiority by emphasizing damage limitation strategies. This is the idea that you fire nuclear weapons first to damage the other side's nuclear military power so that when they attack you, they attack you with less power. The implication is that nuclear deterrence isn't as solid as people think. For China, uh, Beijing might find it irresistible to use nuclear weapons in a limited war over Taiwan, at least to avoid being defeated.
Now, a direct challenge between the U.S. and China is unlikely. It is more likely that a conflict will escalate out of a trivial dispute, typically involving an ally. So far, in 500 years of power transition, no challenger, particularly a land-based power like China, has ever succeeded in supplanting a naval hegemon through a direct challenge. And the principal reason is that the naval hegemons more easily make allies. Now, there have been a number of incidents between the U.S. and China. The U.S., of course, is concerned with trivial, trivial incidents escalating to a confrontation. So, it has signed the MMCA, the Sino-American Military Maritime Consultative Agreement, to establish a set of principles of non-provocative behavior between the U.S. and the Chinese navies. It's modeled on the Soviet Incidents at Sea Agreement and requires warships, for example, not to target each other. Uh, however, in uh, the tw early 2020s, China showed up for a couple and then did not show up for others in order to pressure Washington. So China is not sincere in avoiding incidents. In, in fact, it's a part of their, of their erosion tactics against the U.S. and other navies. There are a number of incidents. In 2002, the People's Liberation Army Air Force harassed the U.S. Navy ship Bowditch, which is conducting submarine surveillance near Hainan Island. In 2005, the Chinese Han nuclear submarine tailed the U.S. aircraft carrier Kitty Hawk. March 9, 2009, the Chinese harassed the U.S. ship Impeccable uh, near Yulin in Hainan Island. In December 2016, China seized a U.S. drone in the South China Sea, subsequently returning it. And in February 2023, the U.S. shot down a Chinese balloon over U.S. airspace. This is the incident in 2001 in which a Chinese aircraft collided with an American EP-3, killing the Chinese pilot and causing the American aircraft to emergency land in Hainan Island. In 2011, U.S. President Barack Obama announced a pivot of the U.S. focus toward Asia. You can see U.S. grand strategy depicted here. The heartland, which is the core, the world island, is kept fragmented by the U.S. because only unification of the heartland will allow the concentration of forces capable of overrunning the island democracies that are outside of the Eurasian landmass. This is very similar to the British policy of keeping Europe divided. So the U.S. intervenes with its Navy carrying Army and Air Forces into the Rimland in order to keep the heartland fragmented. So new deployments to a number of states in the region include Australia and an eventual redeployment of seven of the 11 carrier groups to the Pacific Ocean that were intended for 2015 but have not yet occurred. There's forward deployment of air assets designed to cooperate with the Navy in the Pacific. For example, the deployment of B-2 bombers to Guam. The U.S. has 11 aircraft carriers, of which 10 are the Nimitz class and one is the Ford class. The main threat to U.S. aircraft carriers are submarines, the DF-21D ballistic anti-aircraft carrier missile, and of course, cruise missiles launched by Chinese bombers like the H-6. The post-Cold War U.S. Navy was designed for cost-effective littoral operations in uncontested waters by peer powers. So the U.S. needs to reconfigure the Navy for surface action. In other words, bringing back an equivalent of an F-14 aircraft able to shoot down incoming anti-aircraft carrier cruise missiles. The Cold War U.S. Navy was larger and had much better anti-submarine warfare and anti-cruise missile systems in the form of the S-3 Viking and the F-14 Tomcat. The current U.S. Navy has an entirely nuclear carrier fleet. Its Aegis-class cruisers can intercept low-orbit or, or low Earth satellites and ballistic missiles, and it has a much more widely used vertical launch system with a much greater missile launch capability. During the Cold War, the Soviet naval threat was several times more powerful than that of China in 2023. The Soviet Union had powerful surface action cruisers designed to overcome the air defenses of U.S. aircraft carriers, fleets of backfire bombers carrying supersonic anti-ship missiles, 
250 submarines, including the fastest submarine in the world, the Akula class, missile attack submarines like the Oscar, which are some of the biggest submarines in the world, designed specifically to ambush and destroy U.S. aircraft carriers, helicopter carriers, and plenty of foreign bases from which to operate. You can see here the Moskva and the Leningrad, the, the helicopter carrier that's in the top left of the image, and the uh, Kuznetsov, Varyag, and Ulyanovsk, which were the aircraft carriers that were in the process of being built that are shown in the bottom, and you can see the Kiev class on the right side. This is the Tupolev 26 backfire bomber, which would have fired the AS-4 Kitchen. This was a major threat because it could operate off of Soviet bases, and these aircraft had very long ranges, and so they could reach out from the Soviet Far East into the Pacific, into the Indian Ocean, into the Mediterranean, into the Atlantic, into the North Sea. And so it was uh, an all-ocean threat. And the US F-14 was specifically designed either to ambush these aircraft while they were flying to the staging area where they're going to fire their rockets or to intercept the rockets themselves. A major focus of the US was to use cruise missiles to destroy these bombers at their bases in the Soviet Union or uh, deployed in bases in allied countries. This is the S-4 Kitchen. It is a one-ton warhead, 400 kilometers range, and it flew at Mach 4. Now, China's got an equivalent range uh, from its missiles, the DF-21D anti-carrier ballistic missile, as well as the H-6 bombers that fire cruise missiles. And China could reach out and strike targets as far as Guam, and you can see some of the uh, oil parks in uh, Guam, which would be providing fuel to the uh, air base there. This is uh, Okinawa, where the U.S. Marine Corps and the U.S. Air Force is based at Kadena Air Base. This island facility, which has a Marine Brigade, uh, is vulnerable to attack because it's just off the Chinese coast. And so it's unlikely to be able to provide a significant um, uh, counter Chinese uh, air element. It's likely to be neutralized. If China's going to attack Taiwan, this base is going to be rendered inoperable. The U.S. plans an 11th carrier, the Ford class, to be deployed by 2023, equipped with long range drones to destroy enemy ships. Its surface ships are to be equipped with short range lasers and possibly rail guns, although that's an on and off project. The U.S. has also developed an air-sea doctrine in which it is technologically optimizing cooperation between the U.S. Navy and U.S. Air Force, such as re-equipping its Air Force to carry very long-range anti-ship missile systems, as well as to share intelligence between different platforms. The U.S.'s operational goal is to use its Navy for sea control to the second island chain and then dispute or sea denial from the ocean all the way west to the Chinese coast. Carrier groups would likely entail four to six carriers working in conjunction. A U.S. submarine force of around 20 submarines would operate within the first island chain, targeting China's main amphibious ships and the surface craft like aircraft carriers and their cruiser escorts. One of the goals will be enforcing a blockade. In a conflict, the impact of the U.S. Navy is primarily to be felt in the economic blockade of China's trade and energy imports. China may attempt to do the same to the U.S., as the Soviets had planned in the Atlantic and in the Pacific in a U.S. resupply to Japan. And Germany tried twice in both the First and the Second World Wars. And, of course, the French pursued the same strategy under um, uh, Louis XIV and Napoleon. So these are the uh, U.S. fleets deployed around the world. This is uh, Diego Garcia, the U.S. base leased from the British in the Chagos Archipelago in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And the U.S. from here would deploy uh, bombers and surveillance aircraft to work in conjunction with the Indian Navy to deny Chinese entry into the Indian Ocean. These are assorted U.S. Pacific bases. Uh, and you can see where the stars are, uh, Okinawa, Guam, uh, and Hawaii as well as sorted uh, deployments of surveillance facilities in Australia. These are U.S. bases deployed in the Western Pacific, including in Japan, Misawa, Yokota, and Iwakuni, 
and in South Korea, Osan and Kunsan. In the Ryukus, you've got Okinawa and the U.S. base in Guam. So the U.S. does not have a lot of basing facilities outside of Japan, and South Korea is unlikely to permit the U.S. to use those air bases to strike targets in China. So the blue area is likely to be shut down by the U.S. Navy, a major through point for Chinese uh, economic merchants. And the U.S. is likely to dominate completely the area in the red rectangle. This is a Chinese underground listening facility that they're very likely deploying in the South China Sea. The Japanese and the U.S. has probably already deployed listening devices along the uh, Chinese uh, continental shelf in order to monitor the movement of Chinese submarines. You can see here the exports as percentage of GDP for both the U.S. and China. Of course, this is uh, an issue for China because if a third of its GDP is exports, it's vulnerable to an embargo by submarines. These slides demonstrate the relative greater independence of the U.S. from foreign trade. In uh, 2011, the U.S. received about a quarter of its oil from Canada and 10% from Mexico, and only 10% from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, with almost 10% from Nigeria. Uh, in 2022, again, the overwhelming amount of oil coming to the U.S. is from Canada followed by Mexico, Saudi Arabia, Iraq. So the U.S. is essentially uh, continentally dependent on Mexico and Canada, which makes it very difficult for China to blockade the U.S., even if it had a large submarine anti-commerce program. These are the largest uh, food import partners with China uh, in uh, 2010, and it's the U.S. and uh, Brazil. Chinese corn imports come primarily from the uh, U.S. and Ukraine in 2021. You see here in 2021 the very large increase in beef imports, primarily from Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, New Zealand, Australia, the U.S. China leads the world in rare earth elements, but there are competitors that are shifting availability to other parts of the world, including Sweden and Japan. Here you can see China's proposed terrestrial pipelines that allow it to receive oil from the Middle East, Central Asia, and Russia in the event of a naval blockade. Although 83% of Chinese oil comes through the Strait of Malacca. So in a war with China, the U.S. is likely to adopt the NATO strategy of a conventional naval counterforce attack against China's naval nuclear deterrent. This means the U.S. will hunt down and destroy the Chinese ballistic missile submarines with special forces, submarines, cruise missile attacks, and air attacks. In a war with the Soviet Union, the NATO plan was to attack with a fleet of aircraft carriers and submarines into the Barents Sea and the Sea of Okhotsk, destroying the 60 Soviet ballistic missile submarines. China only has six and soon eight ballistic missile submarines, and these are most likely deployed at the Sanya Naval Base on Hainan Island. So here is the uh, Sanya based on Hainan Island, where these ballistic missile submarines try to patrol unhindered in the South China Sea, but are obviously coming up against U.S. submarines and listening devices. This is the Sanya Naval Base on Hainan Island. This is a side view of Sanya base. Now it is possible that the Chinese ballistic missile submarines can deploy just off of the Sea of Okhotsk and thereby get closer access to targets in the continental US. But it's expected that the US would patrol this area. Alternately, the Chinese can receive Russian permission to deploy in the Sea of Okhotsk, which is uh, shown here on the Russian continental shelf to the northwest of the uh, ballistic missile submarine operating area. 
So probable conflict locations. Well, the U.S. is likely to engage Chinese military forces around Taiwan or Korea, the South China Sea, the Ryukyu Island chain of Japan, on the Himalayan frontier of India in conjunction with New Delhi, or against uh, U.S. Pacific bases at Okinawa, Guam, or Hawaii. Now, U.S. allies. Australia has close strategic relations with the U.S. and the ANZUS Defense Treaty, but its largest trading partner is, of course, China. In 2005, Australia declared it would prefer neutrality in the event of a Chinese attack on Taiwan, though this position would likely be reversed in an actual war. Australia's main concern is not China, but Indonesia, with its very close proximity and population of 275 million people. Canada's primary concern is with regard to Chinese security and Chinese interests in the Northwest Passage, particularly through the Arctic, which provides much closer access to European markets. China had its uh, first Arctic icebreaker expedition in 2012. In 2012, it also sent an oceanographic cartography vessel to map the surface for resources. Now, I wrote an article examining the shortcomings of Canada vis-a-vis -vis Australia. Now, Australia is in the same rough hemisphere as China, but if you look at the actual range of missiles and the concentration of the population, the population in British Columbia of Canada is actually closer than the Australian population that inhabits the southern eastern portion of the Australian continent. Australia has consistently had a higher level of defense spending because it, does, it has less of an opportunity to free ride than uh, Australia does because of the protection that is provided to uh, Canada. One of the reasons that there is so much of an issue with having to oppose China in Canada is that it intrudes on electoral politics. The Conservative Party were consistently uh, more anti-Beijing in their policy and this cost them seats. And so the Liberal Party, particularly in British Columbia, has been reluctant to take a strong stand against China because it would lose those seats. The Chinese population in Canada is about 5.7%, which makes them politically consequential in certain key urban areas, particularly Markham and Richmond Hill in Toronto and Richmond in British Columbia. And about 45% of the Chinese population in Canada, overwhelmingly recent immigrants from mainland China, generally are sympathetic to Beijing over Washington. And this is a, an issue for Washington. Now the US really can't do much to get Canada to follow US foreign policy because Canadian foreign policy is generally anti-American. Canadian grand strategy is to closely associate with European powers that can counterbalance the US. It's for that reason that whenever the US goes on a military expedition, Canada only joins the US if the French go, because France is a proxy for Canada's alliance with Europe. The United Kingdom is not, because the UK is very dependent on the US. It uses the US to counterbalance the influence of the Europeans. The US and the UK share uh, nuclear weapons uh, technology, particularly the Trident ballistic missile uh, that goes inside the uh, ballistic missile submarine of the uh, Royal Navy and the U.S. Ohio class ballistic missile submarines. And so ca Canada does not lean on the U.K. It expects the U.K. to jettison Canada. So Canada's, uh, in effect, um, joining the U.S. when it comes to liberal foreign policy, but balancing against the U.S. with uh, European allies when it comes to trying to maintain its strategic autonomy. And so uh, any pressure the U.S. puts on Canada is likely to have uh, some domestic blowback. However, during both the uh, First and Second World Wars, Canada was very conscious of uh, U.S. strategic interests. During the Second World War in particular, when uh, U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt became involved in the Second World War before the actual attack on Pearl Harbor, Canada was very sensitive to appear that it was actually being a team player in the coalition against fascism.
So I made a piece looking at the limits of American pressure on Canada. The prevailing wisdom in the U.S. is it's not wise to put significant pressure on Canada because Canada could break. It's fragile politically based on a coalition of uh, French Canadians and uh, English uh, immigrants and this uh, um, a consensus has been further expanded by significant immigration, one that's on a higher level than immigration that's occurring in the U.S. And so the U.S. is very reluctant to push Canada too far. However, in this piece, I indicate that Canada is actually uh, more robust than the U.S. thinks and probably uh, could be maneuvered politically into um, pursuing some of the uh, liberal foreign policies that the U.S. Uh, is engaged in in the Pacific. China's relationships with Israel were primarily focused on technology transfer. From the 1980s, Israel participated in science and technology commerce with China, some of it in violation of U.S. military licensing agreements with the U.S. The U.S. quickly moved to block the attempted Israeli transfer of the airborne early warning aircraft, the Falcon system, diverting Israel instead to cultivate a security relationship with India, where the Falcon was ultimately sold. The Chinese GF-17 fighter aircraft has a similarity to the Israeli Lavi fighter, suggesting illicit Israeli weapons technology transfer after the U.S. cut funding to the Lavi. The picture in the top right shows that China has had a very old Chinese community, but that community was uh, swept away during the Taiping Rebellion, when up to 20 million people were killed, and the uh, traces of the community were lost. Hal Brands at the American Enterprise Institute made a very interesting argument in getting ready for a long war with China where he argues that a U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan is very likely to end up being a, a long war of attrition. John J. Mearsheimer in his text, The Conventional Deterrence, showed in many case studies that most countries start off with an idea that they're going to conduct a lightning strike attack seize the territory and then compel the defeated country to negotiate. This was certainly the case in the 18th Saint-Vrigny Franco-Prussian War, uh, but it failed when Germany attacked France in 1914 or when Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union uh, in 1941 or when the Japanese attacked the U.S. at Pearl Harbor in 1941. And all of these conflicts ended up being long slogs and attrition conflicts where it wasn't military skill as much as economic dominance came to determine who would eventually be the victor after many years of warfare. So Hal Brand makes a number of arguments the first one is that the great powers have enormous strength, and this allows them to fight for a very long time. This was first observed by Jan Block, who uh, wrote his book in the 1890s. He was a financier uh, in the Russian Empire, and he noted that the uh, modern states of Europe had built up enormous capacity to mobilize men, resources so that wars would not be short affairs. They would be uh, contests between different industrial systems that would last for a very long time. Hal Brand looks at, of course, the, uh, or rather he mentions uh, examples of wars that started out short but turned out to be very long. The Napoleonic Wars, uh, the Crimean War, the Russo-Japanese War, the First and Second World Wars, the Korean War. Now there are counterexamples, of course the 1866 uh, Prussia-Austrian War, the 1870 Franco-Prussian War, and the 1895 Sino-Japanese War, where overwhelming power and strategy applied against a weak government did produce quick peace. Number two, determine the structure of the international system. Because of the stakes at play between China and the US, they're likely to continue fighting. The country that's defeated, like Germany in World War I or Germany in World War II, is going to be subjected to significant territorial changes. As well, the victor determines the international structure of trade and the international organization. The United Nations is in New York for a reason, because the U.S. was the dominant economic power of the Second World War. Similarly, the defeat of France after the Napoleonic Wars had significant implications. It reordered 
the powers in Europe. This is what China is fighting for. And if they fail, they will fall to a second status power, as other countries like India have younger, more robust populations. Number three, dictators of authoritarian states will choose to continue a war since defeat means their death or severe punishment. And this is very likely the fate for Xi Jinping. The uh, leaders of Japan, uh, many of them committed suicide. Um, the leaders of Germany were put on war, uh, war uh, uh, crimes trials to punish them. And it's very common for authoritarian leaders to be punished severely as compared with uh, leaders of democracies who simply lose an election. And very rarely are they imprisoned. Number four, dictators use surprise attacks that rather than intimidating democracies tend to produce outrage that causes wars to go on much longer. Even though the Prussians defeated the French in the Franco-Prussian War in 1870 at Sedan, this led to the fall of the French government when Napoleon III was captured, but it led to a mass rising of the French population. And even though the Prussians were able to surround Paris, they were not eager to continue a war against the entire French countryside. So they made peace took the provinces of Alsace-Lorraine and left. The Japanese attacks on, on the Russians at Port Arthur, the um, German attack uh, towards Paris in 1914, the German attack on France in 1940, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, the North Korean push to, to Pusan in 1950. All of these were events that triggered rather than cowed the democratic countries, causing them to engage in the conflict, in most cases for years. Number five, the US and China will expand their conflicts to open second fronts. The US, of course, will institute uh, almost an immediate naval blockade if the, if the conflict is on a very, very large scale. China's objective uh, will be to try to distract the US by engaging in hostilities in the Himalayas uh, or targeting Japan or encouraging its North Korean or Iranian allies to attack client states of the US, like South Korea and the other Persian Gulf states. Number six, war aims will expand from a focus on Taiwan to the longer goal of imposing regime change. This was elaborated by Fred E. Clay in a book entitled uh, All Wars Must End. He worked for the US State Department. He observed that in the First World War, when war broke out, the promise was that the war would be over by Christmas. As the war went on and the casualties rose, governments shifted their positions. They promised some sort of revenge for the death of the soldiers. And so they, uh, rather than having the war end simply on an armistice, they claimed that they would demand reparations from the adversary. Now, as the war went on into its second and third years, the losses became enormous. All liberal politicians who didn't promise everything were basically pushed out of power through elections or normal politics, and they were replaced by leaders who demanded unconditional surrender of the enemy. And so World War I, which could have ended in the first year, dragged on for four years, ultimately causing the collapse of the regimes in the Ottoman Empire uh, Wilhelmine Germany, the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a communist revolution and breakup of the Russian Empire, and the impoverishment of the Italian, French, and English state that ultimately contributed to the collapse of uh, colonialism. Now you can see uh, here various um, regime changes achieved through containment. Uh, you can see on the top left the collapse of the Soviet Union, the top right in 1989, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the bottom left is the rise of Germans in 1918 that forced the Germans to capitulate at the end of the uh, First World War, and in the bottom right you can see Napoleon being exiled to the island of Elba, which ultimately failed and he went back to uh, resume war in France, and then he was imprisoned a second time on the island of St. Helena where he died. Number seven, nuclear weapons may embolden China to persist in its war aims. As long as China's got nuclear weapons, it can rely on its superior population to conduct a war of attrition until the U.S., which has far fewer soldiers, to eventually give up. 
Now, there are two aspects to this that may not confirm this logic. First of all, nuclear weapons may come to be used on a tactical level. It may become very tempting to use a nuclear depth charge far out in the ocean or a nuclear torpedo far out into the ocean to destroy a U.S. carrier or to attack a U.S. submarine because, of course, how could it escalate from the ocean? But nuclear weapons used at sea, while they're tempting, they eventually end up used, being used against ports on the coast, which are providing services and intelligence and are basing the aircraft that are chasing the ships. And so nuclear war could spread onto land and then become a general tactical engagement. And once tactical nuclear weapons are used, well, then you can elevate to operational nuclear weapons and then a few strategic weapons. And then you could have a sudden rapid escalation of a disarming strike between one country and the other. As well, number two, China may use its nuclear weapons in fear that the U.S. would destroy them with conventional weapons if they're not launched. So it's possible if the war is large enough, the U.S. will hunt down the Chinese ballistic missile submarines and the silos and the mobile rocket systems with conventional drones, thereby not triggering a, triggering a nuclear war. And China's faced with a use it or lose it dilemma, where if they don't fire the nuclear weapons through attrition, all of those weapons will eventually dissipate to a number low enough that they cannot penetrate the U.S. missile defense at um, Fort Greeley in Alaska and Vandenberg Air Force Base on the coast of California.